Welcome to Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Monday, September 3rd, 2012. Our top story comes from the world of biotechnology. Collaboration between multiple institutions has been developing electronics that are compatible with living tissue, specifically for use in engineered tissues which are grown in a lab and have many research and perhaps even therapeutic potential. An issue, however, is monitoring the cells inside the tissue, which is important to ensure the tissue is healthy and observing how it reacts to the artificial environment it's growing in. Animals have an autonomic nervous system that naturally keeps track of various factors and then stimulates a response to correct any imbalances. Engineered tissues don't have this, so scientists need an artificial way to mimic this functionality on a small scale. It'd also be useful to stimulate this growing tissue in a controlled way, to see if it's functioning like it would inside an organism. Previous attempts to integrate electronics have had limited success, mainly involving growing cells over top electron devices. Implanting devices within engineered tissue is also not very effective, because on this cellular scale, the devices are very large, disrupting normal growth. To solve this issue, silicon nanowires were treated to become biocompatible and incorporated into a cellular scaffold. Heart and nerve cells were grown in this scaffold, and the scientists could successfully measure electrical activity within the tissue without disrupting it. Another important development was creating engineered blood vessels, also containing these nanowires, and they were able to monitor pH both in and outside the vessel. As we mentioned before, this has major applications in tissue growth for research purposes. It's the first truly successful integration of electronics and tissue. This could even be used to monitor impaneled tissue used in medical treatments. Once tissue engineering becomes more advanced. Next is an update from the field of genetics. Scientists from Germany have experimented with better ways to regulate viruses. As we've discussed on Brainstorm before, viruses have many practical applications in science and medicine, mainly as gene therapy vectors for inserting DNA into organisms, generally replacing a defective or mutated gene that's causing a disease. However, that's not the only use for viruses in medicine. Another is using viruses to target and destroy cancer. As you can probably imagine, this comes with certain risks, considering we're basically using viruses because they can be very good at killing our cells. Viruses designed for this purpose usually have additional genes for the production of human protein that trigger an immune response or cell suicide. Even if the virus is cancer-specific, these genes and their protein products need to be tightly regulated to avoid collateral damage, i.e. destroying non-cancerous tissue which is where RNA switches come in. Essentially, an extra sequence of DNA is added to certain genes in the virus. These both get transcripted into one molecule of messenger RNA, and this mRNA can't be translated into the target protein unless it interacts with a certain molecule. This molecule would be specific to activate or deactivate the viral mRNA. In this first experimental RNA switch, the molecule kept the viral protein from being produced in infected cell cultures, and removing the molecule increased production by 10 times. While it's the first time a mechanism like this has been incorporated into a virus, further development could lead to effective viral treatment against cancer. We end with a story from the world of nanotechnology. Rice University researchers have been testing a nanoparticle for its ability to help people after a brain injury. Before we get into the nanoparticle and why it works, we should discuss what happens after a brain injury. There's the initial trauma, and that damage is done within a few minutes. But there are other factors afterward that can make things worse. One of them being the release of reactive oxygen species, which are compounds in cells that are generally toxic. Particularly after trauma, the brain releases a compound called superoxide, which the immune system actually uses to kill bacteria. It's normally kept in check by a specific enzyme, but after an injury, superoxide levels spike and overwhelm normal regulatory mechanisms. Excess superoxide causes two main problems in the brain. Firstly, it disrupts the regulatory mechanism of blood vessels, which are supposed to contract with high blood pressure and dilate with low blood pressure. Secondly, superoxide actually reacts to form other reactive oxygen species. All of these factors contribute to the end result of trauma and making things worse. But fortunately, it's also where medical personnel might intervene. Finally, we get to the nanoparticle, originally investigated for anti-cancer effects, and it has an extremely long name that we'll abbreviate to PEG. Animal tests showed that PEG quickly and effectively neutralize superoxide increases, far more effective than the natural enzyme and with no noticeable toxicity. 
Other groups will need to replicate these results, but further testing will hopefully result in this nanoparticle being a valuable tool for first responders and military medics. PEG's extreme antioxidant properties could have application other than brain injury, such as organ transplants. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.